This will officially be the shortest series that we cover. Maybe you've seen it. Maybe it feels like a dream. If you've watched Chiller or Sci-Fi, then it's likely you caught this one as they would run marathons of it. Touch that remote and you die. Touch that remote and you die. It's time to visit the Nightmare Cafe. Sadly, it wasn't until 2009 that I actually knew this existed. If I knew then what I knew now, I would have tried to save it. I'm not sure that me and a group of five people would have been enough, but it's the spirit that counts, right? I wanted to share this one with all of you because I think it deserves a little more love than it's gotten. So what's a nightmare cafe? Well, only special folks are chosen to work in the cafe. Have a little accident? Need a second chance to prove you weren't a total piece of garbage? Do you have the skills to work alongside Freddy Krueger? Not unless you're Nancy fucking Thompson. You're nothing. Okay, here you don't have to have those skills. I'm sorry if I've disappointed anyone who has charismatic sleep specialist on their resume. Whatever you do, don't fall asleep. So, Robert England is Blackie, the keeper of a cafe at the edge of town. The cafe is sort of a living, breathing entity of sorts, so you can't piss it off or it will set your coffee on fire. No, not in the McDonald's lawsuit sort of way, more like massive flamage. Greater forces at work enlist two very undead employees, Faye and Frank. With the help of the cafe and at times Blackie, they're able to help poor unfortunate souls to navigate the trouble they find themselves in, and hopefully redeem them. You might say to yourself, Nikki, this isn't very Wes Craven-y. Well kids, neither was Music of the Heart, but I still watch that. You gotta stick with the team whether they win or lose. Okay, sure, it's not straight horror, but it does offer something a little different from the guy who could have written or directed a horror movie in his sleep. It gets a pass. Craven came up with the idea with his son Jonathan when they were toying with the concept of a show akin to Twilight Zone and Amazing Stories. He wanted to have the characters bookend each episode while still maintaining the anthology aspect. This was retooled before it was pitched to NBC as Craven wanted the characters to be the center of the story. Originally, when it was presented to NBC, they turned it down, and when the president of NBC at the time offered to cut it down, Craven was understandably upset. They wound up reworking it, bringing the time down to an hour and a half, and Craven was actually happy with the result. Well, why do we love it? When this came on, I immediately got sucked in. Once I had marathoned all six episodes, I was left with that what the fuck why feeling. Often this does not happen to me. The last time I got this upset was when they canceled Channel Zero. Let people be weird for the love of God. This had a different feeling to it. Sure, by Wes Craven's description, it was Twilight Zone meets Cheers. Gee, that's hard to believe. But for good measure, it was also Quantum Leap and Moonlighting, if you can imagine such a thing. It could have easily been Doctor Who as the cafe was like the TARDIS and could manifest wherever souls were in dire need. While the show was an anthology, it also had its three main characters. As time goes on, we get to know a little bit more about the characters, though it would have been nice if the series had continued that we would get a little bit more on England's character, Blackie. Anytime England is on screen, he immediately draws light into the room, and it's unfortunate that he didn't get to do more with the character. Don't get me wrong. I love Lindsay Frost and Jack Coleman as well, but Robert England can't help but be the life of any party he attends. The role of Blackie at the time had pulled England away from the dark pit that was playing Freddy. He even mentions in an interview that he laughed on set one day and part of his Freddy voice slipped through. As a fan of England, seeing his lighter side is always kind of a trip, like playing Willie and V. Seeing him as Professor Wexler in Urban Legends was pretty great as well. Anyway, this isn't a Robert England love video, though it should be. Oh, and this one also has a pretty cool intro. Now that I've got your attention, here's the deal. This is one of those shows that you watch and you either don't care that the concept is a little much or you'll watch anything Wes Craven does. Either way, you can't lose in my opinion. Time for my favorite episodes. Pilot. You ever watch something and you aren't sure what's going on and it may not even make sense but you're still completely intrigued and zoned in? Yeah, that's the episode for me and actually most of them. I'm just here for the ride. Let me say, this one was directed by the great Philip Noyce who you know from Dead Calm, The Saint, the badass of Harrison Ford as Jack Ryan in Clear and Present Danger as well as Patriot Games. We start with two people, complete strangers who have found themselves crawling out of the same body of water. Frank, played by Jack Coleman, spots a lovely woman in a red dress just as drenched as he is and says, I thought you drowned. You okay? She sees this as a come on and here our dynamic begins. The cafe suddenly appears drawing them both inside. Robert England pops up, unbeknownst to us as our narrator and possible minion of the afterlife himself, Blackie. He's rooting against them from the beginning, while they spend the episode rooting for each other. From here, Frank and Faye, played by Lindsay Frost, sister of Mark Frost, who we know from Twin Peaks, just sort of assumes their roles of cook and waitress at the cafe. Things only continue to get weird from there. 
After Faye changes into her uniform, she hears crying and opens the mirror to see a reflection of herself bawling her eyes out rifling through a medicine cabinet. Meanwhile, Frank turns the TV on in the cafe and sees Faye changing. He turns it off before it gets too racy. When she comes back into the drab 50s diner, the TV comes back on and reveals how they both got dumped in the harbor. This episode is pivotal as it gives us the initial background on the characters, as well as how they are connected, and shows us how each episode of the series will play out. Joan Chen, also from Twin Peaks, pops in at the end and we never see her again. Just wanted to let you know in case you get your hopes up. Faye and Ivy. This one centers on Faye's little sister Ivy, played by Molly Parker. Ivy has an incredibly terrible and abusive boyfriend who we think at the beginning is going to be alright, but we should have known better. We find out he's in the relationship with Ivy because he thinks Faye may have a butt ton of cash. Ivy wanted to see her sister whom she seems to idolize due to these glamorous letters she's been writing. It's been almost 10 years since they've seen each other. If you watch the first episode, again, important. You know that's all a farce, but at the time of writing the letters, Faye doesn't know that. I do have questions on this one, like, why didn't we guess the boyfriend was a turd? To, why does Blackie still go through with the tattoo on Ivy after she's extremely hesitant? Just do it. Or, most important, why doesn't Faye reveal sooner that she's Ivy's sister? And, why can't Ivy tell that's her sister? Maybe she got that Carla Gugino son-in-law makeover. Despite these burning questions on my behalf, we do start to understand more about Faye. I can understand why she's hesitant to tell her sister as life didn't turn out the way she wanted. However, the cafe does allow her the chance to save her sister and bring them together with their mother who winds up being kind of a boss. Oh, I love Molly Parker, but her run as Alma on Deadwood was so good that I probably said some not so nice things about her character at my TV. The Heart of the Mystery. This is as close to horror as the series gets. As you all already know, it didn't get a chance to go this route again, so we'll forgive this. This is a whodunit of sorts centering on a cop played by Timothy Carhart, who has to solve the mystery of who killed his love before a bullet fatally wounds him. Note, this one also is the closest in tone to Twilight Zone for me due to the noir aspect. This is one of the best in regards to writing and acting. Each one of the actors chews through the scenery on this one, and it's a good indicator of what could have been in sore down the line. I'm struggling whether I should tell all of you who's the shooter in this one. If it wasn't for its obscurity, I would have spoiled it by now, but I think it's best to have this teaser debate you to watch. For me, it was pretty obvious, but I had my doubts for quite a bit of the episode. The last 10 minutes are nightmare fuel for sure. It's also interesting to note how very Mulder and Scully that Frank and Faye are. especially since this was before the X-Files debuted. My dude Lachlan Monroe, who was recently in the oh-so-amazing Peacemaker and basically every other movie show on the planet, is in this one playing a total creeper. Aliens Ate My Lunch. This was the only episode written and directed by Craven. It's also the oddball of the bunch. However, the only thing I need to sell you on this is Lieutenant Briggs, cows getting abducted by aliens, and Robert England doing his best Farmer Joe. Is this horror? Absolutely not. It's sci-fi comedy. It's a missing X-Files episode. Oh, and it's probably the weakest of the series, but it's so weird and wild and you have to see it just to say that you did. I'm not entirely sure this episode would get airtime today. Look, if you haven't seen this or if this is your first time hearing about it, please go check it out or at least as much of it as you can. Let me know if you dug it and even if you don't because we're cool with everyone's opinions here. Now, where do I find it? Nowhere. You literally find four episodes and it ruins your goddamn life. Okay, if I found four episodes, it's somewhere. You do a little Google search and you'll get up to episode four. There are some sites that offer the others, but unless you want to end up spending your weekend getting hijacked by some dude who watched too much hackers and says he needs 3k to free the hostage that is your computer, then just stay away and wallow in your sadness. Or, Patrick, upload the other episodes from your VHS collection. Quit teasing us. That's it. My hope is that MGM stops holding the series hostage since they never officially released it and that ends up on Shudder or Screenbox or literally any streaming site. It's only six episodes, come on. It barely existed when it's on air and now we're just trying to erase it. Well guess what buddy? We won't let that happen. <sighs> but seriously Patrick, help me out. You promised us like three months ago. We don't want to buy any bootleg DVDs from the back of some guy's 93 Honda Civic. How it ended. Sadly, Nightmare Cafe got the rug pulled out from under it rather quickly. Word is, there was a writer's strike at the time, and when it was over, folks just didn't go back. I've also seen it was due to declining ratings, but what isn't at this point? There are several reasons to miss the show. The biggest reason being that it never got a real shot. Now I have to sit here and wonder what could have been. Do Frank and Faye ever realize they're a great couple? Does Robert England just freaking snap one day, and when watching the diner TV says, Welcome to prime time, bitch! Guess what? 
We'll never know. It's going to be one of those things that people just say, oh yeah, I think I remember that. But the show just doesn't get its proper dues. What I admired most about Wes Craven was the care with which he had for his audience, and how he knew they deserved more than surface horror, which isn't always bad, but the psychological aspect of his works were always what drove me to his films. If allowed to run longer, it's possible it could have grown to become an even better show, maybe one that lasted longer than half a season. It's funny to think that Freddy's Nightmares lasted longer, and we saw what happened with that one, even though we dearly love it. Nightmare Cafe will always be lost somewhere between time and eternity, and will forever leave me with a feeling of what could have been. Until next time, my creepy companions. Punk got off easy if you ask me.